Hello, Living Word family. We are glad that you've joined us on YouTube. We want you to be a part of this message that touches your life every day. So on behalf of Pastor Pierre, my wife and I, we are glad that you engage. We want you to subscribe because there's so many messages on here that you could listen to on your leisure. We are glad that we're able to serve you. But we also want you to go to our website. When you go to our website, you will find a lot more information, even the sermon outlines. And also, you can provide an opportunity for you to see a list of our materials, books that you can look at that meets your need, and you could share with other family members or friends. We could also give. As you give to Living Word, you know us. When you go to our website and you do that, we use those funds to serve the agenda of God for the glory of God, and that allows us to serve you effectively. So we're glad you're here with us. Subscribe, be a part of this, and I pray you join us again and keep involved as God so leads you so that we grow through these times and are coming out of it better than we went in. Thanks for allowing us to serve you. Well, I'll be, um, I'm excited about this sermon, but I'm also, I approach it with fear and trepidation. Why? Because the word is always deep. But my prayer for you is that you, your hearts are ready and your ears are ready to listen for the sake of hopefully edification for the glory of God. But before I do that, can we give it up for Kieran and Gracie? That is nice. Can I have a, a, a very honest moment with y'all? Um, I expected that out of Gracie. I was shocked by Kieran. I, uh, she, Kieran shocked the mess out of me. I was like, oh, wait, he, he is passionate. He made me believe it. Gracie, I knew could do it. I, was, uh, I didn't know. He put on a polo. He became a different person. <laughs> <laughs> Proud of you, bro. You killed it, man. Can, can we stand and read the word of God together? What I'm going to do is I'm going to intro this passage. Pastor didn't finish, and as you know my motto, if pastor don't, I don't have to. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to do the best I can to be extremely intimate with this text, and you're going to understand why, um, because there's so much word choices by Paul in the church, writing to the church of Philippi that I don't want to skip over them. But for the sake of our time, Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read verse 4 with you, and I might keep going if you don't mind. Uh, hopefully you all are excited about the word. It says this, although... Um, I myself might have confidence even in my flesh. If anyone has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. This is important. Circumcised on the eighth day of the nation of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law a Pharisee, as to zeal a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. We're going to spend the rest of our time in verse 10, 11, and 12. It says, And that I know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, Now that I have already re obtained it, uh, already became perfect, but I press on so that I lay hold of that for which um, also I lay hold of by Christ Jesus. It's a lot. Let us pray. Dearly, Father, I want to say thank you so much for the opportunity for us to get into your word. My prayer is that everyone here came here not to attend church, but actually to, to be intimate with you. Um, God, I pray that this is not an attendance. This is not something marked off for blessings, that this is something that we desperately desire to grow closer to you, but to do it together as you have told us to do, that your body was fitted together for this very purpose to, to be the readers, of, the readers of Scripture, doers of the Scripture, where family gets together and, and focuses on same mind and same purpose towards you. So, God, I pray that this sermon is exactly that that you'll remove me from the picture, that everybody can see the beautiful paint, picture painted of you, and that nobody will even remember anything that I say, but everything that penetrates their hearts through the word of God. God, I, I really genuinely pray for your people. But before I can pray for them, I got to pray for myself, and I pray that everything that flows out of my heart is pure, that my mouth will reflect that, that nothing steals away from your glory. No personality gets in the way of your presence. So, God, I thank you. God, I also pray, and as I conclude this prayer, as I always pray, uh, I got pray that they remember your message and forget the messenger. So, God, I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
I don't know if my brother's here, but I want to say this. I'm, I asked his permission, um, but this is all an edification of who he is. If you have ever met my brother, he is like a silent person. He's like my mom. You'll never know he or he's here, but if you know him, you would know why I mean this word. I always wanted to be like him, right? I, I think my brother had so much swag to him. Um, there was something about the way he dressed, something about the way he moved, and no offense, in the 90s, light skins were in style. But you know it all changed. And now we back. Black. And, and, and the way Paul moved, it just had a way about him. And, and, and I was like, you know what? When I grow up, I'm going to be just like, I'm going to dress like him. When I go to stores and shop for clothes, I would try to dress like he dressed. It, it was something about it. But I just, I didn't know what it took. And, and I guess I wanted it, but then I didn't realize that all the sacrifices light skins make um, to get their eyes perfect in pictures, it's, it's a lot of sacrifice. It's a lot of sacrifice to dress up every day. I like the basketball shorts and sweatpants look. That, that, is, that is who I am, but not a, not a, not a light skin. They have, they put in effort, okay? And I guess that is, that is why I, I, I duck-tailed off and became who I am, that, that, that I, I just didn't, I wanted the look, but I didn't necessarily want the sacrifice. And for many of us, you're going to realize through this passage is that many of us want the look of a Christian, but don't know the sacrifice. That many of us see it, and we want Christ, but we don't recognize that comes with a loss, that, that you're going to have to spend some time doing things you don't want to do in order to present yourself a certain type of way. And that, yeah, I want, I want my skin to change, but I don't necessarily want the sacrifice to do so. And for many of us, you're going to be sitting in this church saying, God, I want the basic of you. And better yet, I want the Instagram of you. I want the pre presentation of you. I don't necessarily want the intimacy with you. And right here we have Paul saying, hey, I had it all, but I counted it loss. So it means I had the presentation of religion. I even was the eighth day circumcised. I was the one who did it all, had it all. I was the one who made sure I obeyed the laws, even called me blameless and righteous. You couldn't find nothing on me. I showed up the church, had the suit on. I made sure that the, there was a crease on my suit. It was what you would want from me. But then when I realized who Christ was, when I had this interaction with him on the road to Damascus, when I started to realize what his glory really was and I started to realize who Jesus really was, I would, I would sacrifice that all for intimacy with him. The problem with the church is that we want intimacy, but we don't necessarily know what it takes. Second, we want intimacy, but we don't necessarily we realize when we have to lose, we don't want to lose it. And many of us came to church today, and we're trying our best to make it through a sermon. And God is like, but if you want intimacy, you're not making it through it. You're going to me. And my prayer as a preacher is that I lead you straight to Jesus because that's all you want to hear about today. But if you came here to hear a personality, I missed already. Because the whole point of a sermon is to lead you closer to the person you're already in love with. And right here, he said, I gave it all up. But then he gets to verse 10, and he says, to know him. Oh. See, I'm going to separate some clauses here, and I pray for all my intellects you would appreciate that. What he's fixing to separate is what you would think knowledge looks like, an intellect, a, a ability, a Pharisees of Pharisees, the one who would know things. And then he's going to say, but I don't want to know that. I want to know you. Because the last time I checked, people who had head knowledge with no heart knowledge put them on a cross. So the second problem with the church is that you have PhDs that put Jesus right back where he came from. That is that we, we start to make you legalistically follow Jesus. We put rules in boxes where Jesus never tells you to. That some of us are living in a box and not experiencing the freedom of what intimacy feels like. It's like many of us who've been married, but then you have a rule book for your marriage. You just say, Friday's date night, but you have no intimacy when you show up. Both of y'all's heads or phones are in your phones when you're there. You're not even talking to each other, and we treat Jesus the same way. And we show up to church, but our phone is a distraction. We show up to church, but our Bible doesn't know us. That many of us are like, hey, it's date night. Here we are on Sunday, but I don't necessarily want to know you. I just know I got to be here. And for me, I struggle because I'm, I, I get to those days, and I don't know if you've ever been there on Monday through Saturday, that many of us have a, have a knowledge of who he is. We recognize we need to do what he says do, but we don't necessarily know him. Because if you knew him, you would know there were certain things to him. 
uh, I guess for me is that if you're like me, that you miss. And many of y'all like want A's on your spiritual progress report, but don't want to do the homework. And so here we are where he starts to say, what is knowledge? Because I had knowledge beforehand. Y'all heard him? He said, I had knowledge beforehand. I, I knew. I, he says who he was. He, he tells you how he was circumcised. He tells you that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews, that he had nine languages under his belt. He had Greek and Hebrew memorized, Ph.D. done. He was the guy that you wanted. But then all of a sudden he says, all that was a loss. And then he says, I want to know. So as you already kind of hinted at, the first word for know in your Greek does not necessarily mean physical information or overload. It is the fact that, pay attention, I just want to be intimate with you. See, before you even talk about it, what is your motivation for being intimate? We'll get there. But how many of us are desperately desire to be intimate with Jesus? Not finish your rule book. Not make sure your devotions are done so you can get it out the way. Not 10 minutes or listening to a podcast so you can say you know more about how to stay in your relationship. I'm talking about how many of us desperately desire for me and him to have this intimacy that cannot be replaced. That the moment I'm absent from him, I miss him. Like, it's like traveling without Monica. People always say, I'm not trying to sound holy here, but I'll, I'll travel to some places that have some nice, I, uh, I'll sleep on a f- tent on the floor, but that's not the point. They'll be like, today's beach day. And they're like, Pierre, you're not going. It ain't the same without her. I don't want to go to a beach and frolic with dudes. Like, no, I want to go. <laughs> it's me and Monica. I, I don't see the beach without her. And that's how many of us should wake up in the morning and say, I don't see this day without him. Like, why would I enjoy a day where there's no intimacy with him? That many of us are just like, hey, I can enjoy life. I go to the club, I go to get my hookah lounge, and I'm enjoying. And God is like, that's an L for you. The first thing you need to understand is how many of us desperately desire to have what? Intimacy with him. You can lay in the same bed, but there's a difference between laying in the bed and having intimacy with your wife. And some of us lay in the bed with Jesus. You came here to lay down. Some of us are mentally laid down. We, we came here mentally just tired, and God is like, no, 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 you missed it. This is your moment where our preacher is going to hopefully lay out the word and only point to me, and you are so excited about me, you pay attention. Not because Pierre is good, it's because my word is. But then the second connotation I need you to understand about the word no, it means no by experience. This is where he separates your dialogue. This is where many of us miss is because we can get the head knowledge, but we don't have the experience with him. What he's saying is that if you know me, then you experience me. Then what does it mean to experience Jesus? Like many of us have information about and practice of, but it's not an experience with that we, we, I'll give it to you. I'll go back to my brother. My brother played football. But he actually played football. Like, he loved football. And because I saw my brother love football, I thought I loved football. And so what I did is went out to play football like my brother played football. And Paul would come home and tell stories about hitting people. But he made it sound so glorious. Like, he would be like, I laid this dude out. It's not coming out his nose. Now, picture Pierre, me, glasses, and I was like, I'm going to make people have snot out their noses. And so I went out there, and I remember it was fifth grade, and I played free safety just like my brother. It was my first year out there. I put on the pads, and that's back in the day when your pads made noises when you ran. You remember, like, so I was excited, and I was like, you know, I could feel the wind in my helmet, and this big guy, or to me big, came down, and it was just me and him. And I remember I hit him. I don't remember nothing else. (laughs) That was it. That was the whole point of the story. I know I ran towards him. I know contact was made. I have no idea what happened after that. I think snot was coming out of my nose. (laughs) Like, is this what it feels like? I I didn't like it. I guess my point is saying is that some of us are like, God, I'll go to the depths with you. But then, then you end up cursing somebody out while he goes to the courtroom. Is that you don't want to take the hit for Jesus. You just want to show up where he's at. 
You don't want to necessarily go to practice and sweat in them pads. You don't necessarily want to be in 90-degree weather. You just want the story. And what he's saying is, like, if you with me, you're going to have to experience me. And if you experience me, you're going to take some losses. But North American Christianity, we just tell you run around with pads and Nike and wristbands on, and you're going to be all right. Some of us have back flaps on in our shoulder, under our shoulder pads, but they never got hit in the back. You don't even know what it feels like. We like to look good, but I'm, the whole point of putting on pads is to get hit. The whole point of knowing Jesus is to get hit. Some of us just want to walk around with pads on and look good. Then he says a couple more, and I'll kind of conclude this point. It's not a mere intellectual practice. Can I, can I talk to my intellects real quick? I appreciate you talking to me about five-point Calvinism, and we'll do that. Uh, if you want to talk about eschatology, we can do that. If you want to talk about pneumatology, we can do that. But at the end of the day, if you could tell me how much you know, but you're not intimate, I, I don't talk. If you ain't treating your wife right, let's, what's the conversation? Like, what are we doing? So you could tell me all this pneumatology, but you go home and talk to your wife that way, then why are we talking? I'm not trying to be rude, but at some point, it got to hit your practice. At some point, there has to be an experience. And the last time I checked, if you have an experience with somebody, I don't know, like a road to Damascus, like Paul is referring to, then guess what? It is life-changing. But if you're still the same person, after experiencing Jesus, one of the two is missing, you or him. But he don't miss, so it got to be you. So the only thing I can point to is if there's no life change after experiencing him, do you know him? That's like saying I know my wife but then cheat on her. Because if I'm intimately involved with her and I love her for who she is and our oneness, then why would I go and do something else? It's a miss all the way around, but let's get deeper. It says not only is it not, it's in a personal encounter with him. Paul's referring to the road to Damascus saying, when I experienced him, the persecutor of persecutors, when I experienced him, I could no longer persecute the same. Hear me out. When I had a personal encounter with Jesus, I couldn't even do the same thing I used to do the same way. So therefore, no offense, we have to ask a hard question to all of us in the room. Can you still do the same thing the same way after experiencing a God who changes your sames? You shouldn't be able to. You shouldn't be able to cuss the same way. You shouldn't have the same attitude. You shouldn't be at the same places. The problem is, is that many of us don't want to take an L with our lifestyle while we gain Christ. <laughs> that some of us ain't even ready for what it really cost. And I'm like, it's an L. Like, and we got to start sharing the gospel like that. If you want to still be you, then what's the point? Because if I love somebody, my life changes. I'm sorry, that was harsh. He recognized that the value of knowing Jesus was more important than the value in additions to his life. He recognized that the goal was just to know. And whatever that cost, it was worth it. And I want to get to that point, whatever it costs, it's worth it. If it costs your sex life, it's worth it. If it costs your purity, it's worth it. If it costs you deleting some apps that are your favorite, it's worth it. If it costs you fasting some days, it's worth it. it, it the only reason is because your motivation is so high to know Jesus, you're willing. Because it's worth it. And it, it, we got to stop putting rules and books on that. It, if God called me individually, not me, I'm not forcing this on you. If I say, you know what, I think I want to start fasting with the Lord. That's your stuff. That's, that's a spiritual discipline. But what I am saying is you're like, you know what, I feel distant. How do I draw it back in? And you start saying, I'm willing to lose food, lose this, lose that, lose this dating. I need to take a break from dating. It ain't working. You start to take L's because you realize it's a sacrifice. But what we want to preach a gospel where there's no sacrifice included. And guess what he's fixing to change to? He's saying, I want to know God, but also if he experienced it, guess what he starts saying? Then I want to experience it. So that means when Monica goes and has surgery, then I want to experience it. I want to be at the doctor. I don't want to leave. I want to sit there until it's done. I want to make sure that I'm the one, the first person she sees when she gets out of the hospital bed. I'm the one that picks her up, takes her to the car, by her bed, asking, do you need water? Because what you're experiencing, I may never feel what you feel. Because Jesus, you can never die on the cross like Jesus did. But I want to be by your bed when you wake up. I want to be there when you're there. I want to be here when you're here. I want to sacrifice. So even if I take off work, I'm going to be here, baby. I don't think you understand. It's going to take an L. 
And he starts telling you, Jesus, I don't want your blessings. Guess what he starts telling them? He says, God, I want to know you, but watch the word he chooses. He says, I want to know the power of the resurrection. He's like, hey, hey, you died, and then you gave me power, but the power only came through your death. Therefore, I want to live only in the power, not in my own, not in my legalism, not in the things that I can use my own power for, because the last time I used my power, I persecuted the church. So I want the new power. The power that only comes through the resurrection, that old power that only came that rose you from the dead three days later. Give me that power. And so what does power even mean for those who are wondering? Power means you have the capability to function within the power of Jesus. You don't have to cuss like you used to cuss because you function in a new power. You don't have to treat your husband or your wife the same way because you function in a new power. You don't have to be the same single because you function in a new power. This power had the same power to resurrect Jesus, and how come you still the same? If, if, if this power can take God and God can raise him from the dead, but you can't raise yourself to get to church, what are we doing? We're too tired to be here. And God's like, but then what power are you functioning in your human flesh? If you go on with your human flesh, it's an L all the way around anyways. All I want to know is the power you function in, Jesus. Because the last time I checked, if I function in that, nothing's impossible. And many of us have like, I, Pierre, I'm never going to get over this. And I'm like, you won't on your own. You're definitely not. If you try to take this on your own, you, you're going to lose. Like, there's no motivation for you. I would give up too. But if I have, start saying, God, if you can raise from the dead with this power, then I got the same. The word means capability. It means it's there. You got to use it. That means everybody that is saved in this room that can hear my voice, is given the Holy Spirit. It's called instant sanctification through the Holy Spirit. The moment you're saved, you're sealed. And when he seals you, he gives you his Holy Spirit, which has the same power. That means you have to function in the Spirit in order to what? Use the power. But if you say, I'm going to use my flesh in this argument, guess what comes out? The flesh, because you used it. But if you use the power that is given through the Holy Spirit, you don't even argue the same. You don't even think the same because you're functioning under a new power because God has made you capable. You, you know what he also lets you have? Free will. So you have a choice whether you're going to use it or not. So it's a good, beautiful, gracious gift, meaning you, he can't force you. It's like walking past the plug and saying, I don't know why the light's not on. I'm not going to force you to plug it in. That's up to you. But if you want to walk around in darkness, go for it. And some of us are walking through this life in darkness like, I don't know why the lights won't turn on. Plug it in. <laughs> plug it up. I mean, just, just, and then hit a switch. It's your choice. But if you're going to say, hey, man, I'll look here. You don't know how hard this life is. It is hard. That, that's why he gave you what? Power. Because if you wanted the life to be easy, you wouldn't need power. He gave you power so you can go through a hard life. If you want some crosses for you, you can go to Acts 1.8 where he gives you the power. Romans 1.16. You can cross reference to Romans chapter 6 and you'll realize that the same scripture is talking about you have been given the resurrection power. And there's so much beauty to this text. And I want you to have it all. But he also says, you know what? This power of resurrection is him referring to, hey, he's saying, hey, I know I had a historical knowledge of Jesus dying. I didn't believe it because I wouldn't have persecuted the church if I did. So I, I knew of the figure of Jesus. Because I persecuted Jesus, I, per I persecuted Christians because they were believing in a figure, meaning a person. But now that I've experienced you, I don't want a figure anymore. I want the resurrected version. It's going to make sense. So he's saying, as a Jew of Jews, I believed in the figure that Christians were willing to die for. I was killing them. But when I experienced you on the road to Damascus, now I'm like, hey, you're no longer a figure. You're an experience. And many of us treat Jesus like he's just a figure in your life, a cross, a piece, a chain. That's what he starts to become. So you don't cuss in church, but you cuss outside the church. You listen to gospel here, but you don't listen to gospel there. He's just a figure. Because a figure, pay attention to this, if it's an historical figure, a figure is only powerful when it's present. But if it's an experience, that means Jesus goes with you when you what? Leave. So you can't do, it's not a, like, I ain't going to cuss in church today, but when we leave. We're going to continue this argument. 
And I'm going to be hearing Pierre's sermon. I'm going to be thinking about everything I could say. No, no, no. The whole point you're here is so the argument changes when you get in the car. Because you experienced something. And, and, and if we always talk about experience real quick, we, we got to stop making an experience an emotion. I don't, look, man, if you, I, I, I've gotten accustomed to, I preach at different churches by God's grace, I've gotten accustomed to if, if there's no verbal responses, meaning it's not an experience where it has to match your emotions. Uh, if I can only get your emotions going, I failed you because I'm only tapping into what you think is an experience. An experience is, 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 is transformational. Are you with me? Like, like if, if you just have a worship service, ooh, worship was good today. But you don't leave different? That was a moment. We got to stop using the word and experience and attaching it to your emotions. I tell people all the time, you could believe me or not. All I'm saying is emotions are temporal. An experience with Jesus is supposed to be permanent. It's called a progressive sanctification. That means time after time, growth after growth, grace through grace, that I continue to grow closer to his glory. That means through an experience with Jesus, and as I continue to experience Jesus, not one moment, I start to closer and start to look more set apart for him. Now, backtracking on the theology, I want you to stop for a second. Everybody gets emotional at times, I understand. But if the only thing that grasps you is you keep looking, guess what you come to church for? Another emotional experience. So guess what the church starts to do? Feed your emotional experience. Therefore, we have to get another singer, another band, another bass, another this, another sermon about the same issue. And we keep what? Feeding an emotional response. And God's like, stop cheapening what experience is. And the church is failing because we keep feeding people into an experience. The last time I checked, if you need an experience, you should go to Six Flags. And hear me. And I mean it. Because it, guess what happens when you go there, you ride a roller coaster, you're like, whoo, that was fun. But you don't walk off saying, man, I hope I have a roller coaster in life. Like, that's not what you do. It's a one-time hitter. How do I know that I'm old? I never want to go back. All right. But then he tells you another type of knowledge he wants. He not only wants the resurrection, he goes on, he says, and I want fellowship of his suffering. Wait, you're not telling me he didn't say fellowship with his blessings. Prosperity. Money. Riches, because Jesus didn't have none of those things, but moving on. He's saying, wait, I want fellowship. Well, watch the word fellowship for me. It means close association with. That means, remember I talked about intimacy? He's saying, I don't want to just know you suffered. I want to experience your suffering. How many of us are like, Jesus, really take me through something. I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, Jesus, look, I would really pray you make me broke again. I, I, I. So for those who are worried, because you're like, Pierre, I'm not praying this prayer with you. Like... <laughs> Take me back to my singleness. No, I know that you're not praying this with me. But he's not talking about, watch, he's not talking about physical suffering because you could never suffer the way he did. He's talking about the fact that a spiritual transformation takes that the fact that you will suffer. Meaning, the moment my insides start to change, I'm going to have to lose what? In certain areas of my life. So therefore, because I'm associated with your suffering, I will start to lose in my physical life. That means I give up things I want. I give up what I want to do. Therefore, the spiritual transformation in my life makes me suffer in my life. But guess what? Suffering starts to get easier the moment you get closer to the Christ who suffered. Because you count it what? First Peter chapter 4, verse 13, what does it say? Not only do I count it all joy, but he goes on to say, look, if you experience the sufferings of Jesus, you're blessed. Like, th you want that. Because God is like, hey, a part of pain means progress. Suffering differently is the best choice of words. Can, I, can you just hang on tight for this one? Everybody in this room will go through suffering. If you're trying to escape it, you'll never grow. But when God allows it, your whole purpose is to grow through it. Bear with me. Because pain sometimes, not all the time, but most, some of us can learn in our pleasures. I, I understand that. But pain causes what? Growth. So therefore, when you face the same type of pain, guess what happens? It doesn't hurt as bad and becomes more of a lesson in your growth progress. So everybody's like, I remember that Jesus took me through this, and I remember, watch these words, the power of his resurrection that got me through it. So therefore, even though I'm suffering again, 
I'm okay. I'm content in all of my what? Circumstances and issues. I'm content here. I'm content with taking L's. I'm content with getting bitten. I'm content with shipwrecks. I have learned to be content in all things, even if it means my physical suffering as well. But we have a lot of people who are waiting on God to fix their suffering before they experience God. And I'm like, no, experience them in it. That's the closest intimacy you have sometimes is when there's nobody else to answer it. It's even when you come to counseling with me or you go to your therapist and they're like, look, man, I'm sorry. Look, you know when somebody ran out of options, when they hit you with the I'm sorry, that means they have nothing else. I'm like, man, look, man, I'm sorry, bro. Because they ain't got nothing for you. But guess what they do have? Well, guess what you have? Jesus. One of the biggest lies that a North American Christianity has ever told was that life with Christ is the absence of suffering. When in reality, life with Christ is the presence of him while you suffer. That you don't have to do it alone and without power. That you don't have to do it under the power of your own flesh. That you have hope. It even says in death, when you suffer and you see, have people in your life that have passed away, you says, he said, don't even grieve without hope like the people who don't have Jesus do. He even tells you, like, yeah, it's still horrible, but you don't grieve the same. Suffering. I want close association with, but watch one more word. I want your participation in. How many of you in this room, including Pierre, counted a not only joy, but I want to participate in the sufferings of Christ? Because if you trust me with the suffering, have y'all ever thought about that? Do you trust me with it? I don't, I don't know if there's certain areas in my life where God trusts me with it. Would I steward the suffering well is the best choice of words. And you know what I used to struggle with? Financial insecurities. Anytime I had a financial insecurity, I was out there trying to hustle, record Little League football games. Y'all know my story. I was out there looking like a stalker. Just getting paid $100 on a Saturday. Not spending time with my wife, just thinking I could make another $100 because I struggled. And then God did some things that I couldn't understand. And finally, he taught me, he's like, I've been providing the whole time. I don't know why you're struggling. That $100 didn't do anything but fill your gas tank up. I would have done that on my own. And finally, it got to a point where I'm better at, not all the way there. And well, even when it's tight, I still give him glory. Even when I'm struggling. Even when people don't necessarily like me because I'm a people pleaser. Learning to be alone and lonely. Learn to lead by myself. These are areas where we all struggle in here, y'all. Nobody wants to suffer. The question is, do you learn your lesson while you do? Do you get better because? We have too many marriages going in the cyclical pattern of the same thing because you ain't learning. The only thing you've learned to do is be roommates. And you be got good at, (laughs) if we're honest, some of us got good not at suffering, at just not doing anything in it. Moving on. And then he says one thing. He says, hey, are you okay with all of the misfortunes and all the events of life? That's suffering. That things will come. But then he says, being conformed to his death. So I had to look this up because you know Romans 12, 1 through 2, talks about be transformed, be renewed by the conforming of your mind. All these, all these conforming, transforming words. And then all of a sudden, he gets to this point. He says, conformed to the point of your death. What, what does conformed even mean? Is that in my life, The more I renounce my selfish desires is the more I begin to act, look, and walk, talk like Jesus. That means what I want, I no longer want. What I want is you, so therefore I start to act, walk, and talk like you. How do you know if you're conformed? That is it right there. That in the midst of your suffering, you still act like Jesus when he did. Best example I can give you is the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was suffering. What was his prayer? Not my will, but thy will be done. Secondly, I'll tell you, did he admit that he was suffering? Yes. Did he admit that he didn't want to do it? In his full humanity, he was like, if you could take this cup, though, (laughs) you could take it. And how many of us been in that room where Jesus in our closet is praying, if you could take it away, I really appreciate it. If I walk out this closet and all of a sudden my wife says sorry, 
I would appreciate it, Jesus. <laughs> you just peek. Oh, she's still mad. <laughs> Let me go back to praying. <laughs> but then Jesus lets you walk out the same closet with the same problems. And I ask, do you suffer like Jesus? Are you conformed to his death? Meaning, are you willing to say, even if my circumstances don't change, my life does. My attitude does. What I want does. That I'm willing to die to my, watch these words, self. So the question you have to ask yourself when hearing those words is how many of us have a lot of self left? And what areas of your life are you holding on to that you know is not Christ? Some of us is our anger. Some of us are different issues in our life. Some of us is the way we talk to people. Some of us is the way we come to church. We're not even ready for it. Some of us is the way we do community. You, you could ask about how many areas in your life you like, that ain't like Jesus. And you know it. You know it. Some of us walk around knowing we fit to act unlike. <laughs> and like, they going to get it today. You knew you did when you crafted the whole email. Word for word, just tick, 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 tick. You knew. Some of us knew when we was texting that long paragraph. And you knew, and you knew I wasn't going to read all that. Sorry to hear that. You knew. The question I have for you is simple. What area of your life is not conformed yet? What habit do you have you won't give up? What thing do you do you know you hope God is not present at? What secret do you think he does not know yet? What thing you do in the dark you think, eh, as long as my friends don't know? What closet have you not came out yet? Only to realize that God is telling you everything in that closet he knows and is still a sin and he's still going to call you out on it. What area are you willing to say this ain't conformed yet? That has not changed to be more like a death for me. That you died with Christ. Go to Romans chapter 6. You were baptized in his death so that you can be a new creature. So he asked the question, as Paul best basically asked, if you have a new creature, why are you still acting like your old man? All right. You see how all of that? That's all the things he wanted to know. Did you notice that he didn't say anything that you would be like, I really want to know this about God. He said everything that we often don't say in our Christianity, this is what I want to know. But then he says, that's present. This is what I want to know while I'm living. But then he gives you one more thing. And I'm trying to get done because I don't have to finish today. But he says, I know one day what motivates him. What's the first thing that motivates? It's just knowledge, knowing, experiencing Christ, intimacy with Christ. The second thing he switches to is a future. This is, this is big for me because I know everybody wants to skip it. A future with Jesus. I always wonder if people want a present with Jesus and a future with Jesus. Does that motivate you? And I'll explain. But let me first tell you about my brother. I wanted to look like Paul. I told you all that. But Paul had a progress to how he got dressed. There was steps to it. A lot of steps. Like a lot of them. And I watched him one day. And I don't know how many of y'all can go back. I don't know if this thing even exists no more. Y'all remember Noxima? Okay. It's still around? Okay. All right. Hey, hey, obviously, obviously I didn't do it. Okay. But I would walk in, I wanted, my, I wanted, when me and Paul would go to the mall together, there were certain people who looked, but they weren't looking at me. So I figured there were some things I needed to change in order for the future to be bright for me. You know where I'm going. So I watched my brother's routine of getting ready, not realizing that facial body and everything needed to change that God said no to. So he would go in the mirror and then he'd wash his face. And I was like, Cool, we had two sinks, wash my face. Then he would take the Noxema, and he would just, you know, light skin stuff. <laughs> now, for those who don't know what that means, I'll explain after church and life app. But he was, 
Ah. And then he would look in the mirror and he'd be like. So I, was, I didn't know that that's how you pose in pictures. It, only light skins know how to close their eyes in pictures. So he had to be ready just in case they looked at him. So if they looked, he had to be ready. Paul had a pose ready. I didn't know that. I was learning. I was a learner in training. So if they looked, he'd be like, I was like, so I go back in the mirror and I'd be like, <laughs> just wasn't the same. I tried. I only got Monica. Uh, <laughs> thank God. All right. And after he'd wash it off, then he'd go with a scrub. Mm. 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 So I went with the scrub because I was hoping that if I looked like him, walked like him, talked like him, I would be able to experience what he was experiencing. And Jesus is saying, how many of y'all are so excited about what you're going to experience one day that it changes how you live down here? That one day you know that good things are coming if you just change the way you scrub your sin. If you just change the way you act, walk, and talk. If you know how to look and stare at the people the right way when you walk into church. Like, what, what happens when you look like me? There's something you should be aspiring for in the future, and that is called heaven. See, the, the, the issue is that if Satan can get you so focused here on earth, then your aspirations for what you experience in heaven makes you not want to scrub in the mirror. That some of us don't scrub and don't change our lives at all because you forget you're going to spend eternity with him. And God's like, if you only saw the fact that your you're, you're, you're spoke is more on the 80 than the eternity. Have you ever thought about that? Some of us are more focused on the 80, 90, if we're blessed, than the eternity. That means there's no number ending. So we stack money. Get storerooms, look good, wear clothes we can't afford, go on vacations, we have the credit card, and then we say, man, that was a good life, only for all them things to fade, and then you're staring at Jesus. And he's like, what did you do with your life? And you're like, but let me tell you. <laughs> hold, 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 hold. Because he says right here, verse 11, and we're going to finish here. We're not going to get to verse 12. You get that from pastor next week. In order that I might attain. This word attain, but there's some, there's some tricky Greek in here, if you don't mind me saying. The resurrection from the dead. So it makes it seem as if he's saying, if, if I don't get to know Jesus the way these things are, I won't get to heaven. Which makes some people who believe you can earn your way into heaven very excited. But that's not what the Greek means. The word attain means to win it. He's saying, I want to win the end. But watch what he's saying. He's not talking about a current resurrection. He already established that. He's talking about an eschatological future. He's saying, in the end, when I am resurrected, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and you can go read it for yourself, like, in the end, when he ascends us into heaven, I get a resurrected body. And I am excited about being with my Jesus one day for eternity. And I can't wait to watch these words, win it. You'll notice if you get to next week with Pastor, you'll start to see these words he keeps using about, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be on earth because I know that one day I'll be in heaven. And I wonder how many Christians they will be excited about heaven would change the way they lived on earth. I wonder if we were just as excited about being in his glory, we would stop worried about our own glory. I wonder if we would stop trying to win an argument because we recognize we're, we're tearing apart our marriage and we would say, because of my heavenly home, I'll start doing my home different. We'll start raising our kids different because of a heavenly home versus an earthly one. We won't even buy as much stuff because why decorate something that's temporary in just a tent? And if it's a tent that's passing, then why am I caught up in so many emotions stuck in this earthly tent? Like he, he, he's saying, hey, why am I trying to win on earth? If I could win, I'm going to win one day. The reason why he says I might attain is what he's saying. He, humbly, in the Greek, humbly, that's something that I, I can't believe God would give me. Like God is going to take the persecutor of persecutors and then take them into heaven. All because I experienced him on Damascus. How many of you have that saying, Pierre, like, I don't understand why God would want to live with me forever. But not only live with me, died so I can be there. But the crazy thing is about how much Jesus does for us so that we can live with them for eternity, but yet we don't live for him in earth. And he's like, but I gave you everything, including power, to live for me but you took the life I bought and you're using it for something else. That's like me buying you a car and saying, hey, but I need you to work. 
Like, hey, this car is for work, but you can use it, take it home, the gas, use the gas card. I just need you to do what? Hey, man, hey, hey, it's for work, but you can use it, right? You don't have to use your own car to get to and fro from work. If you stop at the grocery store on your way home, hey, man, you got to eat. But when you get there, don't use it for things you want. But then you're like, all of a sudden, your boss catches your same work car at the club. And he's like, but why does it say Reliant, but Reliant truck is at the club? And he, the same thing, God's looking at you like, but I, I bought the whole work truck, and I told you I want you to take care of your home. I want you to use it for church. I want you to serve me with this truck. I gave you the truck. I purchased the truck with my own blood. But why are you using the truck for a club? Why are you using it for your own enjoyment? I bought it because one day you're going to work for me here because you're going to live with me here. Motivation. The problem. Is if I can meet, if I can make heaven seem so far away that it loses its attraction, you'll be attracted by everything else. And Satan is very good. He keeps throwing you shiny things. Making us go in debt for shiny things. Only to pay off the debtor with our things. Only to live our whole life paying off a debtor or trying to get debt free so we can live 10 years of experience. And God's like, but I'm giving you 100 years of a debt free experience. I'm giving you a million years. In a million years, I'm giving you eternity with a debt I pay. But you don't want that. You'd rather pay a debtor on earth. It doesn't make sense why we're attracted to coach belts but don't get attracted to church. That we'll buy somebody else's clothes but don't dress ourselves in heavenly robes. It, it doesn't make sense. And you know why it doesn't make sense? Because you didn't pay for it yourself. See, when somebody else buys something, it don't mean it had the same value to us. But when somebody else dies so you can have it, after a while, it, it loses its, 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 its glow. It's like being married for a long time. You was all excited at the altar. But then after 15 years, you're like, oh, well, uh, vacation? And God's like, it's the same excitement. Because one day, that's all you have is me. So then I ask again, how many of us are excited about the righteousness in the future that God has provided? That one day, hear me out, you'll have a complete resurrection, meaning you will be, have a perfected body. Does that your motivation? Because then why would we be begging people to come to church or do read your Bible if that was the motivation? Like, why would God beg you for something that one day you will do for eternity? Like, why does God beg you to sing songs of his glory when one day that's all you're going to do? So if you can't do it here, I'm confused. If you can't serve him here, what do you think you're doing in heaven? Going to buy Gucci bags? Like, what, what do you think? You're going to be like, streets of gold, Louis Vuitton bag. That's not how it works. Back to my brother. If you want to get ahead of pastor, don't. Because next week he's going to spend a short amount of time on the next couple of verses. It's back to my brother. So if you know the story of my life, even if I don't look like it now, I, I kept trying to be my brother. And if I'm honest with y'all, I still love my brother's style. These pants are probably the same color he has in his closet. I went and I went to the same store I always go to. And I, I think about my, what, would my brother wear this? That's usually how I dress. But then it's funny for him to look at me like, you still can't dress. And I'm like, well, I'm trying to look like you, brother. But anyways, I kept playing, I kept playing football because Paul kept playing football. Even though my first love is basketball. Love basketball. I could play basketball with the guys on Tuesday nights all the time. Love the game. But for some reason, I was inspiring to be my brother. And I kept working at it, too, that this skinny body got a little less skinnier, that this large helmet started in mind making contact, that even though he played free safety, I played left corner. And I remember there was one game at Jersey Village High School, and I was like, I, I, was, I was on my stuff. You know, my brother had varsity two years. I only made it for a year because I was a scrub. And I remember they were starting on varsity left corner. And I backed up, and this guy was not looking. See, Paul wanted to hit you when you were looking at him. I like to hit you when you weren't looking at him. But I love the results. 
So after a while, remember I told you the first time I hit somebody, I lost. I, I don't remember what happened. But now, I couldn't wait to hit you. I started the game with a hit for no reason, just to warm up. I was excited. And guess what? Paul, Paul, Paul worked out, I worked out. Paul squatted, I squatted. So after a while, my body started to look like a little bit like Paul's. And even the way I walked down the hall with my varsity letterman that nobody cared about after like a year after, I was strut the same way as my brother, walked the same way as my brother. Now, nobody still looked at me because my face was still the same. But I had to walk down. I even had the pictures right. <laughs> and I remember I went to play college football like my brother. And there's this one game where I felt like I played just like my brother, taking people's heads off for no reason. Even the dad walked up to me afterwards and was like, can you take it easy on my son? I said, I'll try. <laughs> and then I didn't. Because after a while, I, what I wanted to be required sacrifice. What I saw the future like, it required me to work out. It required me to get my head hit a couple times. It required me to have a couple surgeries. It required me to recover from those surgeries. It required me to rehab. It required me to go back into the field like there nothing else happened. It required me to break my hand and keep playing. It required sacrifice. So I guess what I'm trying to say is if you really want to be like Jesus, it's going to require you to break your hands sometimes and suffer. It's going to require you to actually sometimes not get the game you want. It's going to require you to sometimes be able to go out there and work out when you don't want to, sweat in the gym when you don't want to, go outside and run hills when you don't want to. It's going to require you to change. But stop aspiring to be like Jesus and think Sunday service is going to get it done. Everybody wants a game time but no practice. Everybody wants to make varsity but don't want to work out for it. And I'm like, that's the same thing as the faith. How many of us are going to sacrifice? To know Jesus. The best way to say it is how many of us are so desperate for intimacy with Jesus that we'll sacrifice for it? There's no more begging this church to come to church. That's on you. Do you want intimacy collectively or not? There's no more begging you to do your devotions. That's on you. Do you want to be intimate with Jesus or not? Because one day when you get to that game and you get to heaven, God's going to be like, well done. Because you used the life on earth because you attained a life in heaven. My prayers for this church, don't beg for what you should want. Jesus already died so you can have access to power, resurrection, and even his suffering. Let us pray. We are excited that you have joined us and I pray this message touched your life. We pray that you enjoyed it. We pray that it impacted your heart and we hope that you would subscribe and continue to grow with all the messages that are here. You can find a sermon outline. So we're glad you enjoyed it. Look forward to you coming back so we grow together. Thank you for blessing us and for blessing your life by allowing us to serve you.